We can think of these as climate model simulations. Um, they're, um, I estimate they're about 10 years apart. Um, the, the one on, on your left is about 10 years old. Um, it, it has a resolution of about 40 kilometers. And this one is a, is a newer one, actually pretty, pretty recent, and it has a resolution of about four kilometers. Obviously, what's being um, emphasized here is the, um, is the motion of the atmosphere and the clouds. And um, so I, I, I just wanted to make two very quick points about these. First of all, um, both of these models are completely deterministic. There, there is no randomness in this. Um, also, the, these models are not using any weather data. They're just started off and they're just run. Um, the, um, so, so they're actually pretty, pretty amazing that, that they can um, simulate this kind of detail. The other thing I wanted to, to mention is, um, so we'll, we'll think of both of these as climate models. And, and you look at this and you say, um, here, let me write. OK, I just want to be sure they're, they're looping. You'll say, these look like weather. These, you know, th this just looks like what I see on, on the TV. And in, and in fact, you're right. Um, in fact, there is really n nothing that is exactly a climate model. Um, the, the way climate is, is studied or, or computed is you, you create a model that runs weather. And um, just as you would do with observations, you collect data from the model. And you average it. And those averages or other statistics end up being the climate. So, so for example, you, you can see in, in both of these models, they're, they're creating storms. Like, here's a storm over, over India. Um, you, you, you could ask the question, um, well, in, the, in, in that model, how often are storms produced during, during the summer season um, for, for India? And the, the, the way you would answer that climate question is you would simply run this model and count the number of storms. And then th that would be an estimate of, of what, the, what the model produces for climate. OK. Um, the reason I wanted to start with this is because um, since we actually have to analyze this model output to get an idea of, um, let's see here. Uh, since we actually have to analyze this, the, these models to get an idea of, of, of what climate is, um, it's the idea of, of doing climate simulations is intimately connected with, with, with data science. And so you can't, you can't disentangle them. OK, so let, let's start my, my full, full talk here. All right. So I like to run the animations in the front because it's just a, a, little, a little bit easier. And as I talk through things, um, it, you'll, you'll have those, those, those visuals in your mind. OK, so um, I'm going to basically talk about different kinds of climate data. Um, this, this opening here, th this is an aerial view of um, South Boulder here, which we call Sobo. Um, um, there, there's my um, institution NCAR on the hill. Behind us are the uh, foothills of the Rocky Mountains and then the Continental Divide up here. Um, pretty much all you see in this picture is about a 40-kilometer grid box. And so that, that gives you an idea of, of what the resolution is and the, and the limitations of looking at 40-kilometer resolution. 40-kilometer resolution means this entire scene would get a single value of temperature at the surface. When it rains, a single value of rainfall falls on that entire region. Four kilometers is about this much here, I would say. That's about this far. And um, for the folks living down here, um, even 
four, four kilometers is a little bit of some averaging and some blurring because what they're concerned about in terms of climate can be very different than what's happening up, up at top here on, on the ridge lines and on, on the backside. So, um, so there, there, there's a lot of issue of running these models at, at different resolutions and um, what you get and what kinds of questions you can answer. All right, so very, very briefly, wh wh what am I gonna talk about? A little bit more about what is climate, what is a climate model, and then I'm gonna cover um, four different examples of different kinds of data that come, come out of this problem. Um, the things I want to emphasize is that um, climate, climate data tends to be large and it needs um, analysis methods that are uh, appropriate for, for them. In, in particular, um, if you're just bringing um, a set of standard tools in machine learning or in statistics to the problems, um, often they don't quite fit the science and they're not quite a appropriate. Um, and so it, it's important to, to, to think about this interface between what are really the issues in climate science and what are the, um, what are the kinds of tools that we have that, that can build that. Okay, so um, I've arranged this into different parts. Um, there are five parts and um, we'll just run through these. Oh, by, by the way, I don't mind being in, in interrupted. If you have a question, please, please just ask. Okay, so um, some people say that this quote is from Mark Twain. Um, it's, it's actually, uh, it actually appears in a, in, in a book by, by Robert Heinlein. Um, I'm not sure if any, any British authors are, are attributed to this. But anyway, um, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. Um, and really what that's, um, what that's hinting at is that climate is somehow an average or a representation of a distribution of, of weather. And of course, the, the way you have to infer climate is you have to look at a lot of weather and, and, and build up that that statistic. Um, what I like about this picture is we have a, a rain, a rainstorm here, a thunderstorm, although this particular vegetation, you can tell it's quite an arid area. So even, even though we have a rain event here, we know that it probably doesn't rain very, very often. Um, also, we have a large rain, rain event here. I don't know if you can see this in the back, but this is um, a poor homeowner standing in front of his house and he's sort of waist deep in water. So again, a very large rain event. Clearly, it doesn't happen very often because he wouldn't have built a house there if, um, if, 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 if that was common. Um, so, so what we're getting a sense here is um, Weather, weather happens and we want to sort of pay attention to the, to the frequency of it. Uh, a working definition of climate is basically a 30-year average of whatever you're interested in. Although um, when, when we're actually th th thinking about climate in terms of the science, we think of a much, much richer set of st statistics than that. Um, things like what, what are extremes, um, um, what, what will be uh, events in the future under, uh, under climate change. Um, so here, here are some examples of, of climate that would be very practical. So if we're, if we're thinking about um, pl planning ahead for, um, for, for the built infrastructure in, in Exeter, we, 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 we may want to know how it's going to change in, into the future if we're thinking about hazards for, for Heathrow, we want to plan for that very rare but possibly catastrophic of, event of, of, of rainfall there. So the, 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 those would be examples of practical ideas about climate. Okay. So climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. The other side of this is climate models. And what's important about climate models is when we're thinking about answering about questions in the future, really you have to use a climate model. There's, um, I mean, there, there's other, 
there's other things you, you, you can do, but essentially the bread and butter of how we try to make statements about w what's going to happen um, going forward, we have to use an, a, a physical model to try to infer that. Okay. So the, um, the most important thing about a climate model is that it includes the, the whole global system. It includes the atmosphere, the ocean, land processes and clouds, sea ice, um, also vegetation. And um, this is actually, for, for those of you from the, that, that have been to the southeast US, um, this is a picture of something called kudzu, which is an invasive vine that just sort of take, takes over forests. And so that, that last picture is double duty for, for not just um, land land vegetation, but also some human influences on, on the land. OK, so um, all of these things have to be ta taken into account. You know, I would say that there's probably about um, a half dozen to a dozen sort of cutting edge climate system models that sort of build physical systems for all of these and couple them together. Um, the one that's being de the one that's developed at NCAR is called um, the Community Earth System Model, um, acronym CESM. And s some of my examples are going to use CESM throughout the talk, so I, I, I just put that up there. Um, the reason it's a community model is because um, it involves a lot of participation with, with university researchers in terms of um, the, the 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 model development and use. OK, well, we are, we are at the Alan Turing Institute. So I wanted to look at, I wanted to abstract this a little bit in terms of math, mathematics, too. Um, so really, the other way to think about a climate model is it's simply a, a, a dynamical system. We take a state, and this would be a vector that's very big. It could be, it, it would probably typically have millions of components. but um, we don't have to worry about that. We're, we're, we're doing mathematics here. Um, the, the change in this vector over time is going to be a function of, of the dynamics. That is, if we have air moving in a certain direction, there'll be some persistence that it'll keep on, uh, on moving. If we have ocean currents that are moving, they're going to persist. Um, but then we also have some physics. Um, for example, this would include things like thunderstorms, um, and, and other kinds of physical processes. Uh, so the, the animations that I showed you were basically running this dynamical system. We, we started the state of the atmosphere and ocean at, at a particular values, and we simply r ran this forward. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the key here, and one of the reasons why climate models are interesting, is that in the physics part, we can, exclude, we can um, introduce external variables, for example, increasing greenhouse gases, changes in, in, in land use, like um, conversion of cropland to forest, forest to, to, to cropland, um, and, and also vol volcanic e eruptions. And so these will also perturb the system, and we can see, see what happens. All right. Um, so that, simp that dynamical system, which can be written succinctly, actually, in, in terms of the, at least the NCAR CESM, runs into millions of, of lines of, of Fortran code. Um, Fortran code ranging from Fortran 77 all the way up to 2003. And there's also some C++ in there, too. So it's a whole mixed bag of code, very complicated. Um, just, just for the atmosphere at sort of a working resolution, that is, this is a very common, typical re resolution that you would exercise the model, um, you're, you're going to get almost four, 4 million elements in the vector describing the atmosphere. Um, Typically, to, to run five to 10 years of this simulation takes about a day. And um, as I said, this is, a, this is a community model. And so there's lots of, um, lots of input from, from many people that, that, that develop this. And that day of compute would be over how many nodes? Is this, are you talking thousands of machines? Or? 
Um, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. So the, the, the day of supercomputer time, oh, I, I want to guess it would be on the order of tens of thousands of, of processors. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thousands of nodes. Yeah. OK. So um, very brief glimpse of what we can do with these things. Um, since we have a physical model, and since it can accept inputs that, that are external, for example, changing greenhouse gas concentrations, um, we can run these models forward in the future and, and see what kind of climate we, we get. And, and keep in mind that the way we are determining this climate is we are simply having the model generate weather, and we are just averaging that, that weather or studying statistics of it. Um, the, 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 this is a figure from the, uh, the, the most re recent um, IP, uh, IPCC report. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a simulation from present out 100 years. And this is global temperature. And it's showing um, an, an increase. And this is in, in response to a fairly um, High, high rate of, of green, greenhouse gas um, release into the atmosphere. Um, when we consider a lower scenario here, that's the blue, we, we see that there's less temperature in, increase. Um, and the, the important thing to, to keep in mind about this is that if you do want to predict climate into the future, um, part of this is making a story as to what the humans are going to do. And um, you know, I, I would just say, in terms of big open questions, sort of new kinds of data, the the intriguing thing is is to figure out what are the humans going to do, what's the population going to be, how will it be distributed, what is the economic ac activity going going to be. All of these feed back to in, into the system in in complicated ways, and. Um, as, as you can see, um, are as important as the physical system in terms of the whole, the whole re response that we would see. OK, so that's the, that's the in introduction to climate. I want to talk about um, some briefly different kinds of, uh, of data here. And this is really more just to, f to, to get you to feel like um, j just sort of pushing the envelope in, in terms of um, what data is, is relevant and, and the different kinds of problems. Um, this is the very simplest kind of problem. We have um, mean, mean rainfall um, for, for, for North America. This is in um, tenths of millimeters. And what we would simply like to do is take this station data and fill in the entire climate surface for this. And the way we're going to do that is um, th th this is some work that, that I've done on myself. Um, to, to create that spatial surface, we're going to use a, a multi-resolution -re model. And sort of briefly, we're going to take observations, represent them as a climate surface pl plus error. This surface, we're going to break down into different scales. And um, for these geophysical processes like precipitation, there's a, it, this, the, this makes a lot of sense. Um, so, so we're going to break this down into several different scales. Within each scale, we're going to expand this surface in terms of ba basis functions. And these basis functions are actually um, created so that they, they, they fit the relevant scale correctly. Um, they're fixed. They're prescribed. What's random here are the coefficients in, in front of them. And um, I'm not going to say too, too much more about this, except that the, the compact support of the basis functions, the multi-scale, the fact that we have coefficients that are the random quantities, all these conspire to make this problem computable for very large spatial data sets. So about. Ten years ago, people realized that traditional geostatistics, traditional spatial statistics, breaks when you look at large problems. So those sets of equations that I, I walked you through um, have a numerical side, which makes everything work very, very easily in terms of com computation. And 
the reason it does is because we're taking um, dense matrix problems and converting them to sparse matrix problems. And that sort of makes everything wonderful. Um, yeah. Take account of the curvature, you know, because you've got quite a large land mass. You have to take account of the curvature when the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the basis one. For, the, for these particular results, I'm actually doing a projection where I'm cheating a little bit. I'm getting almost a Euclidean pro projection. But, 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 but yes, when you're thinking about these basis functions, you can actually build in great circle distance. Um, you can also build in distortions in them to, to uh, account for the, for the curvature. Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, very, very briefly, here, here's some results. I, I guess may, maybe part of this day is going to be um, geography for, for North America. Um, so so here's, my, here's my North American region. This little magenta square here is, is what I'm highlighting. Um, this is the estimated surface, just to show you that I can do it. Um, this is the estimated uncertainty in, in that surface. And what's important here is in these in these data products, um, besides getting an estimate, you also want to quantify the, the un, un, uncertainty in what you've done. And uh, typically, in a, in a more um, ad hoc context or in just a ge ge geography context um, or a machine learning context, quantifying the uncertainty is, is much more difficult. All right. Um, I wanted to show you a, another way of um, exhibiting the uncertainty in, in, in this analysis. Um, what we have here is the, is the estimated surface based on that data. Um, and what I have here are five surfaces that the interpretation is that they are all equally plausible given the data. Um, the variation of those surfaces from one to the other is giving us an idea of what the uncertainty is in them. And so um, in, in particular, th this may be hard to see, but I've sketched in this magenta contour that's at um, 200. Um, it's, it, it's at the level 200. So, so, so that would be two, two centimeters of, of rain during, during the summer. Um, what you can see is there's variation in this contour from one of these, these draws to the next. And that variation in the contour is really sort of quantifying how uncertain we are in, this, um, in, in determining that. Um, many, many data products that are currently available um, don't do much uncertainty. And they also don't. Um, provide these ensembles where you can actually um, query it and sort of s see things like what, what is the uncertainty in different contour levels or other sort of more, more complicated features. OK, so, so just to wrap, wrap up here, in terms of observational data, some issues are reproducibility, uncertainty quantification, um, incorporating remotely sensed data. So that would be um, sort of combining different kinds of observations together. And then finally, looking at, at extremes. Um, looking at very extreme values in climate is hard because the further out you, you, you go in the tail of the distribution, for example, asking about a 500-year event, if you don't have 500 years of data, it becomes sort of difficult to sort of figure out what to do there. And so um, that's, a, that's a challenge. And in fact, Richard. Richard Smith is, is an expert at, at that. Um, OK, so um, we talked about observational data. Now I'm going to talk about combining models and, and data. And um, the example here is something called detection and attribution of, of climate change. And so again, a, a simple formula here. Um, we have the observed climate, typically like um, surface temperatures. Um, we're, we're asking the question, is this related to what we see when we, gen when we run a climate model and get a climate signal from, from, from that model? 
And so this is just a simple regression where, where this beta parameter here um, is, is, is simply measuring um, how well the uh, predicted signal from the model is, is matching the observed climate. And then, and then we're going to add a noise term here because we don't expect these things to, to match perfectly. If, um, if beta is equal to 1, all is well. The, the signal that we're simulating in our model actually matches what, what we observe. And so that's um, co confidence that, that maybe our model is, is re re reproducing things that are um, for the right planet. Um, so that, that would be detection. The other aspect of this is attribution. So um, since this is a model and we can vary what's being um, used as inputs, these are also called forcing, we can run this model with, with greenhouse gases that um, human activity has caused. We can also run this model without greenhouse gases. And we can ask the question, um, is the observed climate um, a combination of these? And, and if so, what it is? So in, in this particular case, um, if, if our model w was doing well, we would expect that the human cost signal matches part of the observed climate. The natural signal m matches another part of the, the climate. And, and we can actually do inference on these and see, see how well we're doing. OK. so. Um, what, what I want to do is, is briefly give, give you an idea of, of an analysis that um, uh, Matthias Katfuss, um, Dorit Hammerling, and then R Richard Smith sort of did, did, did recently. Um, we have these ingredients where these two are the, um, we could call this the greenhouse gas signal due to human activity, the, the natural signal. Um, in absence of, of human influences. And then finally, we have the observations here. These are all trends over a short period, which is sort of interesting. Um, the other thing about these observations is that they're based on re 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 remotely sensed data rather than surface data. OK. So um, if you remember the, those betas, the, the key issue was whether or not they're close to 0 or 1. One, one being that we have a match between signal and observations, and zero, meaning that there's no, no match at all. Um, this is, a, this is a, a Bayesian analysis. And an interesting detail of this is that there's a, there's a difficult problem of how to model this noise. And what we're seeing here in the analysis is the variation in terms of different choices of how, how that noise is, is modeled. Um, technically, it's the number of EOFs that you're in, including into the noise co, co, covariance. Um, Bayesian statistics has a way of combining in, information. And so um, the, these authors are actually able to, to combine the, these different possibilities into a single sort of coherent analysis. And, and so what we see here is an, is an estimate of the, um, the human cause signal is actually high, fairly close to 1. And we can see that both of these uncertainties do not cover 0. So that's, um, uh, and, and I should say, these are, these, are dis, these are distributions or histograms for those two, co those two beta coefficients. All right. So wh wh what are the issues here? Um, First of all, uh, there's usually not just one data set that is germane or appropriate for this kind of detection exercise. Um, so a challenge is, well, if you have different sets of data and they're not completely the same, what do you do? Um, you have to combine them in some way. Um, in terms of the signals provided by climate runs, often there's limited model runs, and so they're uncertain because their climate signal actually has to be inferred from the weather in the model. And then finally, this discrepancy term, this noise, is often a very complicated process. So, so th th those are all challenges to, uh, to solve. OK. Um, so let's see, observations, observations and model. Now I'm just going to talk about models. And um, I think the, the thing that's been really fun for me um, coming to NCAR 
is the realization that the models themselves are complicated objects and they produce data and it needs to be um, scrutinized in, in, in ways more than just sort of um, simple statistics. And um, this, is, this is being done in the absence of considering anything about the observations or even wh whether this model makes sense for observations or not. I mean, the models can be studied just, just on their own. Um, OK, so uh, th this example involves the CESM large ensemble. Um, if you run a model, um, you're going to get a sequence of weather. It turns out that these models are highly nonlinear. If you change the initial conditions of the model, so if you just change the atmosphere by a little bit when you start it, over time, you will, you will get different weather. You will get the same climate in the end, because the climate is a compilation of this. But um, this second run of the model will look very different from, from, from the first one, just in terms of the cloud patterns and sort of the, the um, short-term motion. Um, so it's, it's interesting to, to run the model a few times just to query that, that variability. And that's what this large ensemble experiment is, is about. Um, so there, I think there are up to now 40 members. When, when I did this um, work, there, there were only, only 30. Um, spatial resolution of about one degree. So that's about a, a 110 kilometers. And um, we're, we're, we're simulating, um, th this simulation goes from 1920 and then goes out to 2080. And um, if you have paid attention to the first part of this talk, you, you know that once we go beyond present, we have to come up with a story as to what the humans are going to do. And in, and in this particular case, the, the technical name is RCP, Representative Concentration Pathway. This is referring to the amount of greenhouse gases that, that are being, be, being released. And the, the 8.5 here is, is re referring to um, how, much, how much warming um, this particular set of concentrations will, will give. Um, 8.5 is a fairly grim scenario where that it's, it's a lot of um, CO2 and other gases being, being released. OK. Um, what we're studying here, it, yeah, Amy? Do you know how um, they, they run the model 30, 30 or 45 different times, and they change the parameter settings in some way? That's what leads to different outcomes. They, Do you know how they choose those parameters? They, they, they change the initial conditions. And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly how much they perturb them. But it turns out, even if you perturb them at the level of double precision, so if you just add 10 to the minus 14th to the initial conditions, you will get different answers. But it's largely due to different initial conditions. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Brian, please. But there's two kinds of ensembles. Most of the ones that we talk about are initial condition ensembles. But we also do perturbed physics ones as well. Tend to put them in different ensemble sets and compare. I see. Yeah, yeah, and 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 let let me just um, piggyback on, onto Brian's. Um, from a statistician's point of view, if you're going to do another run of a climate model, it's an opportunity to change something. And so, um, I don't have a voice in this, but I would have if I did have a voice. I would say, why not change the physics too? I mean. We can figure out, we can disentangle all this. It's an opportunity to see something new. So, um, but, but they have not done that. OK, um, I'm going to talk about not surface temperature, but an interesting um, s statistic of it. Um, this is, uh, I'm just going to refer to this as a pattern. And what I'm showing you here is the connection between a one degree change in global temperature and the implied change in local temperature. And this is just for northern, northern um, hemisphere for summer. So for example, the red is about 2.5. A red pixel here, a red model grid point, means that a 1 degree change in the global temperature results in a 2.5 degree change in, that, in, in, in those red gr grid boxes. Now, this is the mean across these 30 ensemble members. It turns out when we run each of these models separately, 
and, and, and look at them, and remember, here's the first state, but we have 22 more, um, we see slightly different patterns among all of them. We're not so slight. Right, right. Um, so let's see, these are, these are differences from the mean. The scale here is from about minus five degrees to five degrees. So when you're, when you're seeing red here and looking at the difference between this model and this one, um, we're seeing differences on the order of about half a degree in terms of their, their response. Um, so this is, th this is substantial. Um, what I would like to do, um, the, the statistical challenge here, is to be able to quantify the variability among these on, on ensemble members with a view towards trying to generate more than 30. And there, there are reasons for this in terms of people that, that want to use this for assessing the impact of climate and change and can't afford to run many, many extra climate model runs, but would like to be able to query that, that variability. Um, so this is all about, um, I was thinking about making, making sort of a comment about the, the, the Turing test and you know, trying to decide whether some, s someone is a human or this is actually um, th things supplied by, by a computer. Um, but uh, I figured I wouldn't have time to go, go through all that and, and it would probably muff it. And it's actually a little bit, um, uh, Probably coming to the Turing Institute and trying to talk about that is is, is a little bit um, beyond, beyond my ability um, and and my and my job category. Um, but what, what I did want to show you here is the final results of the, of, of of the analysis. So the goal is that um, we have these ensembles from these thirty model runs, and what we would like to do is have a simpler statistical procedure. To, to, to generate m m many, m many of these and generate them in, in ways where they, they match up. And so um, this is just a subjective kind of visual pre presentation that, in fact, this seems to be working. Um, these, these first four are draws from a statistical model that's trying to simulate these, these spatial patterns of of, of variability. The, um, the, the bottom row are the first four from the actual model experiments. And so the, the point here is that um, can, you, can you sort of tell qualitatively the differences be, between these two? And it, you know, they, they end up being, being pretty close to each other. The advantage of these is that I can actually simulate these fields on my laptop on the order of, of seconds. Um, these fields, you actually have to do a whole 100-year climate model run to, um, to, to deduce them. So, so what, what, what this is about is um, building fast statistical emulators of complicated nu nu numerical models. So, the, so the, the data science here is this emerging area of trying to use statistics and machine learning to do this. Um, to try to not, not only reproduce climate models and, and build more um, variety and, and variation, but also to try to extrapolate the, uh, the, the, the climate model inputs to other inputs that, that are close by and, and, and use statistics and machine learning to do that. Um, the other thing, the, the other reason to do this is simply looking at the models in complex ways, you end up learning things of, of, about them. And so that, that's also important. OK, so um, finally, uh, I want to I go ba back to climate models. And um, to me, this is the, the newest area and the most in interesting one. And I put up a, a statue of Sherlock Holmes here, partly because um, this is a, a little bit about being, being a, a detective. You, you, um, the problem is you run a climate model. You look at the output. Something is wrong. And so now you have to figure out what, what is in the model. And keep in mind, this is 200 million lines of, uh, I'm sorry, two, 2 million lines of code. Um, you have to figure out what is it in the model that's causing this problem. 
And the, the actual variables that are manipulated within the model are often different or, um, or more, more complex than the output um, models that, that, you're, that you're actually um, analyzing. And so this is a, this is an, a non-trivial problem. Um, what, what I put up here is just for part of the atmosphere model that deals with, with cloud processes, I've, I've shown sort of basically the, the nodes here. The, the nodes are assigned variables in the code. These connections are how they're all connected to each other in terms of um, the, the computation. And you can see even for this module, it's a, it's a very complex beast. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the simple um, example that, that I wanted to show you here was, a, was basically a a, a proof of concept, and this is um, this is done done by Dan Milroy, who's a PhD student at CU, uh, Dorit Hammerling, Allison Baker, and um, Young Sung Kim, um, all at all at N NCAR. So um, what what Dan did was he made a, a modification in, in in the land model to this um, soil hydrology com component, and um, by, by looking at the, um, what, what changed in the output when he, he made this modification, he could work, work backwards, eliminate many, many variables in, in the code, but he, he still arrived at, I think, on the order of about 2,000 here. And here's his sort of, um, here's his plot of all these network connections between, between the, the, these different variables. I, I should say that Dan, th this, is, um, th this was hard, hard for Dan to compute because what he actually had to do was query the, the Fortran code and figure out how variables are assigned. Um, there's lots of things that, that are going on in, in terms of the code, in terms of um, di di directives and um, variables being being re renamed and so that this was not not an e easy thing to do but but anyway there there it is when he does an analysis of this network he's actually able to find that he can backtrack and the problems in the output are isolated into this soil hy hydrology module so it, it it it's an example of this Sherlock Holmes of sort of looking at clues in the output and then trying to figure out um, where where the model has changed. Okay, so um, just to just to wrap up here, um, what's what are open challenges? Um, better observational pro data projects um, products. Um, adding adding ba Bayesian statistics is, is a nice way to include uncertainty in these. Um, there's the, compa there's the um, comparison of observations to climate model experiments. This is still an emerging area. Um, people look a lot at surface temperature and, and rainfall, but there are many other, uh, other variables that are um, ripe for doing this um, detection and attribution. Um, analyzing the models themselves. There's some rich areas of building fast em emulators of these er Earth system models. And that, that's partly because many people want to get um, information from these models, and they are not climate modelers at, at, with access to supercomputers. It's a very practical thing. And then finally, um, this, this curious thing of simply taking the model code as data. And, and using that to figure out um, what the model is doing and what it, what it, what it shouldn't be doing. OK, what else? Um, so distributed computing for, for large data volumes. And Amy will, will be talking about this um, later, later in the morning. Um, machine learning for detecting com complex patterns. And Prabhat will be talking about this a after lunch. And then finally, this is something that um, I'm, I'm personally interested in getting into is that um, there's this whole side of the climate system that involves people. And that has not been modeled or studied to the to, to, to degree uh, of the physical systems. And so that, that's another area. All right, so thank you.